Hi everybody. It's Wednesday morning at nine o'clock and we are uh, about to start this new book and this will run us pretty much through to Holy Week. It's called The Book of God. I, I know it's backwards, but I don't know how to undo that. <laughs> so um, I'm uh, holding a copy of it. It's been in print for quite a while. The Book of God is the work of a Lutheran pastor by the name of Walter Wongren, who is a, a very good published author. Uh, my wife first ran across him with a book called The Book of the Dun Cow, and it was something that she and my eldest son, when he was growing up, <clears throat> we tried to read to the kids, and that was one of the... the um, books that made a big impression and so forth. I ran into uh, Pastor Wongren at Wheaton College. I, the Army sent me there for a master's in communication and one of the events that year was a Christian Writers Conference of which he was a, a mainstay in making that organization come into existence and he was the keynote speaker and the the craft of telling a story is uh, difficult. It, you uh, not only have sort of the sequence of events, but you have to develop the characters and build the tensions and you know, bring the thing to a climax and then resolve it. And so the writers get together to talk about best ways of doing that and to share their latest offerings. and. Wangren told a story about his adopted daughter who was an African-American woman and he told the story of her kind of coming to terms with I'm a black woman in a white family and world and some of the cruel things that were said and the way Walt told the story there were you were always interested sometimes you were laughing because of what he said and sometimes you were trying not to cry in public to embarrass yourself because of what he said and he moved the thing forward and so um, that's the only time that i've ever been in contact with juan Grin, and it was impressive to say the least so here's the deal uh, and we do this with confirmation, um, and I think it's good here. I'm, I'm hoping that the confirmant kids will jump on this as well. Uh, I started doing with God as a routine part of ministry with the Alpha Course over 20 years ago now. Uh, there's a talk, uh, Why and How Should I Read My Bible, I think is the title of it. And what we honed in on as we presented the Alpha Course and and Confirmation and Adult Study and so forth is this is not an easy thing to get your hands on. The one lesson that I really try to stress to the students in like Confirmation or the participants in Alpha is that the Bible is a library rather than a book. When I think of a book as a modern Western person, the thousands of them that have been in my hands or in the room with me and so forth, they all kind of have a, a way of existing as a book. And the pattern that I as a reader have been trained to do is pick up the book, you start reading at the front end, which is left to right, and top to bottom, and you start turning pages, and you work your way through, and there's an unspoken contract with the author, editor, producer of the book to have it have some kind of consistent logic that becomes apparent to me at the beginning, and they don't deviate from it until the end. Um, that's not the way to read the Bible. Uh, first of all, we package it like a book. 
But the truth of the matter is, it's a specialized, small library of literature by some 60, there's 66 books in the Protestant canon. Um, there's close to 100 in the Catholic canon because of the uh, intertestamental additional writings of the Apocrypha. Uh, different churches in the Christian world will include different books. Uh, our Old Testament is fundamentally the same thing as the Hebrew Bible, but once again, packaging. Uh, and if you do not think of the Bible as a library, then, you know, there's plenty of people who have told stories about, I decided I was going to read the Bible from cover to cover, and I did great in Genesis, first half of Exodus, started to bog down, and I was finished by the time I got to Leviticus, and they throw their hands up. Well, if they understood themselves as working with a library as opposed to a book, they would immediately recognize that Genesis is completely story. There's poems and so forth, but there's a narrative of it. Exodus is half story, and then the story has Moses going up on Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai, depending on what it's called, and he meets with God and he comes down with the covenant. And then it gets into the covenant, but it also gets into the tabernacle and how to worship and how to organize the priesthood. And then you hit Leviticus and you get the laws, the regulations, and they deal with everything from personal morality to cultic practice. And you're, you're going to bog down if you're looking for a page turner uh, and you walk into a, a code book in code by, I mean by statute book, it's not going to go well. So Wandgren is very much aware of this. One of the things that we've run into, for example, is um, our free church Christian brothers and sisters like the Baptists, they quote the Bible a lot. The Bible says, you know, if you uh, are in a Southern Baptist environment, you hear that all the time, and they are quoting overwhelmingly from the New Testament, um, and Lutherans kind of, well, we don't have that culture of memorizing chapter and verse of specific books. I joke around that the only scripture that Lutherans ever memorize is the libretto to Handel's Messiah. Uh, if you read any of those scriptures, people immediately <laughs> start singing the the uh, part, and uh, we tend to minimize in our own thinking the fact that every one of our worship services has four, I would say, fairly substantial chunks of scripture in it. The first lesson is overwhelmingly from the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. And you'll get two, three, four paragraphs in a reading. Every once in a while, like immediately after Pentecost, the first lesson will be from the Acts of the Apostles to get the story of the early church out. Second thing that we read every week is the psalm. And the psalm is the praises of Israel, even though 40% of them are lament. Um, it's the hymnal of the temple, if you will, and in the Christian tradition, uh, ever since the monastic movement got going with St. Anthony, whose feast day is on Sunday, by the way, we have used the Psalms as a, a very prayerful approach uh, to God. The beauty of the Psalms, of course, is that they put into words and conversations with God everything of the human heart and so we read that our third reading of, of the worship service is from the New Testament and so we'll pick up and we will read 
the major parts of an epistle, if it's a long one like Romans or Corinthians, will do some of it one year and some more of it the next year and so forth, but it's always big chunks working through an epistle. And then the key lesson every day is three or four paragraphs, called it pericope, by the way, from a gospel. So Lutherans get lots of scripture. In fact, if you were to come to 152 worship services on Sundays in a row, you would have almost the entire Bible read to you out loud and explained and interpreted in the sermon. So Lutherans get a lot of Bible, but because they get it through the medium of the church year in worship, they tend to feel like it's broken up. And it is. We divide the church year pretty much in half. The front half of the year with Advent, Christmas, Epiphany is all centered on our Lord's Nativity. And then February, we do Ash Wednesday, and we have the 40 days of Lent, excluding Sundays. And then we hit Holy Week, and then Easter Sunday, and then there's the season of Easter that's all focused on the resurrection. Lent is a preparatory time, and kind of major question is, what is it about me that makes him have to go to the cross to save me? And then after Easter, an equal period of time reflecting on what does resurrection mean? What are the implications of it? And then we hit Ascension 40 days after Easter. Ten days later, we hit the Feast of Pentecost, which is a Jewish feast uh, that is the time when the Holy Spirit is poured out on the church, and they pour out into the street proclaiming the gospel, and it's game on for the church. We spend from Pentecost all the way back around again to the start of Advent, focusing in on the teaching of Jesus. And if you look at the lectionary, you get lots of his parables uh, in the season of Pentecost. The epistle lessons tend to be, uh, you know, like built in for preaching a series of sermons, for example. The Old Testament lesson is always linked to the gospel, and we just work our way through the Psalms as fast as we can. So Lutherans get a lot of Bible, but it, they get it in Sundays through the vehicle of the church year. It feels broken up. And they go, I, I don't get it. Well, here's you know, some good news. First of all, uh, even though this is not a book, it's a library, a specialized library, there is what in the literature world they call a narrative arc. There is a story to the Bible. Some people have called it uh, salvation history. Uh, if you're working on the theology and the ethics that flow from that, you can talk about a biblical worldview, biblical theology, and so forth. There is a, from start to finish, uh, consistency. And there is a lot of story, and it's going somewhere. And so... What Wandgren, as a Lutheran pastor and a university professor at Valparaiso, chose to do was, I'm going to tell that biblical story of salvation, and I'm going to present it in a package that is most like what modern Americans read. And so, here you go. So we start that today, and... We're blessed. We, we uh, do not have to worry about, uh, you know, like some people go, well, you can't do that with the Bible. You know, it's the Word of God and, and so forth. And um, we're not trying to uh, take something away from the canonical scriptures. This is simply an aid to help us have an approach into the canonical scriptures that uh, works with where we are, improves our sense of things, and allows us to go forward. 
So, um, the, the book is divided, Wandrens is a book, okay? So, having made that distinct, it's not a library, it's a novel. It's in eight major parts, and those start with the Genesis stories of the patriarchs, the, the, the fathers of our faith, the mothers of our faith. So you have four chapters on the earliest ancestors, and then you have three chapters on God forming this sacred relationship with the descendants of Abraham and Sarah um, as he leads them out of Egypt, which is Exodus. <clears throat> and then uh, part three he calls the, the Wars of the Lord, and they are the stories of Joshua and Judges. Um, those are historical books. They're part of the uh, body of literature that's the narrative story of the people of Israel. And Joshua comes on the scene as an assistant to Moses. At one point in time, Moses got one representative from each tribe and sent them across into the Promised Land uh, on a reconnaissance mission. And 10 of the 12, when they came back, said, there's giants in the land, they'll kick our butt, what are we doing? Let's go back to Egypt, blah, blah, blah. And uh, Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb were the two out of the 12 that said, we can do this. They, they looked at it, they you know, had the data that the other guys had, but they had this confidence, this faith that God would lead them. They had been part of the exodus, they'd seen the plagues, they'd seen the crossing of the sea on dry land, they saw the whole wilderness experience, they, they experienced their God blessing and protecting and leading and guiding, and they felt like, yeah, let's do it. So they're blessed for that. They're the only two that get into the into the land, by the way, because God says, nope. Uh, and he keeps the people in the wilderness until everyone that came out of Egypt had died, and it was just uh, the people that, of Israel that were born in the desert that made the conquest. So the wars of the Lord are uh, initially led by Joshua and to a certain extent Caleb and then they're in the land and the way that it worked was they get into a crisis in three, four of the tribal groups that are closest together and they would cry out to the Lord who would raise up a charismatic political military leader who would rally the people defeat the enemy, and then things would kind of stabilize for a while. Those individuals are called judges, and he chooses to use Ehud, Deborah, Gideon, Jephthah, Samson. There's 12 stories of judges in the Bible, which is right here, <laughs> and he picks on those as representative. And I'd point out, yes, I did say Deborah, um, she was a prophetess and tried to get this one individual that we'll read about to lead the army and he would only do it if she came along like he didn't have the confidence to do it on his own but if Deborah the prophetess would come along and she said all right well you're not going to get the credit for it and uh, he did not the period of the judges rolls into the next phase of the history of the people of Israel, and that was them choosing to adopt monarchy as a form of government. They got to the point where they felt like these charismatic tribal warrior leaders, um, we would do better if we had a centralized government and a standing army and so forth. And over the objections of a uh, fellow by the name of Samuel, who's kind of, he's a prophet, 
He's a judge, very uh, significant leader in Israel. He does not want a monarch, but God tells him, go ahead, let him. And so they start, and they go initially with a man named Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. And he is kind of mixed reviews on him. He was successful militarily. He was successful in standing up a government. But he got in his head that uh, he needed to act like an oriental king and was disobedient to what he was being told to do by Samuel and, and uh, from God. And so God got tired of it and told Samuel, I'm taking the kingdom from him. He's not going to have the dynasty, etc., etc." And in his place, God picks uh, a young man named David who is the son of Jesse in the tribe of Judah in the town of Bethlehem. Okay, so this ought to start ringing some bells. So David is a, a young man. He's a, probably an adolescent when all this starts. Turns out to be a terrific warrior and a natural leader. And he ends up being best friends with the crown prince and marries the royal princess and so forth. And then the kingdom uh, problems with Saul start. David has to go into exile. He ends up being king in uh, Hebron for 11 years after Saul's death. And then the northern tribes, the 10 northern tribes come to him and he rules for 35 years. Um, uh, all right, total 40 years. Um, as king over the United Kingdom, and then the kingdom passes to Solomon, and those are the only three kings of the United Kingdom of Israel. So this great move from judges to monarchy lasts for uh, 120 years, three kings. Uh, they try to pass it on to Solomon's son, Rehoboam, and he's an idiot, and it causes the kingdom to divide again, where you have Judah centered on Jerusalem in the south, and then all the other tribes in the north, and they go their separate ways. And so the Bible gets complicated at that point because there's two groups, and their stories are being tracked. They eventually get to a point where the Assyrian Empire rises up, um, during this time of the United Kingdom and the Divided Kingdom, you see the advent of these individuals called prophets. That's part five in the book. And they kind of start with, uh, he starts it in chapter 18 with the man of God from Judah, a prophet. And then he has Elijah, Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, Jeremiah. And they it's a little confusing because they are speaking in two different kingdoms and it's in the same section of the Bible. And essentially what happens is in the eighth century before Christ, the Assyrian empire is the superpower in the Middle East. And they come down and they, uh, through a series of catastrophes, wipe out the Northern kingdom of centered on Samaria and they're gone. And they almost take Jerusalem but the prophet Isaiah, chapters 1 through 39, uh, encourages the people to be faithful to God, to trust him, to not make any foreign alliances and so forth, and that God will get rid of the Assyrians. And it, historically what happened is, there, I, if I've got the story right, there was a coup d'etat back home. The Assyrian army went back to deal with that, and they never came back. Eventually, that empire collapsed and was replaced by one centered on uh, Babylon, which is modern-day Baghdad, and they rose to superpower status. And then in the um, 6th century before Christ, the 500s BC, Jerusalem fell to them, and the people went into exile. So that's part 6. And you have... Uh, the people living in exile, and the ones that were carried off were all the artisans, 
the literate, the aristocracy, the political class, and so forth, and they're put into colonies on the Tigris and Euphrates River valleys near Baghdad, and their prophets are telling them that this is temporary, that in a 70-year period of time they'll go back to the land, and what happens is a new empire, the, the Persians, who are joined at the hip with the Medes, take out Babylon, and the new boss in town, the new sheriff in town is named Cyrus, and he sees these colonies and thinks, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and so he tells them, if you want to go home, you can, and I'll pay for it. And in the case of the Jews, um, a, a small portion of the people in Babylon went back to Judea, to Judah, to Jerusalem, and they try to get the national life going again. For a short time, they even have a king, but Zerubbabel, but he disappears from history. And you have the priests at the temple as the aristocracy of this restart of Jews in the land. That becomes part seven in Wandgren's book called The Yearning. And the prophetic messages that you're getting there, you have the trying to get the national life going again with Ezra and Nehemiah, the books of Chronicles. Uh, there are some prophets, and they speak to this yearning, and N.T. writes really good on this uh, in Bible study, but there was this sense of it was expected to be a golden age, and it wasn't. And the question was, when's God going to come back from exile? And that's the whole yearning and expectation which leads us as Christians, for the Jews, they kind of say, okay, that's the end of the biblical period, and they stop. And it's like a story where you get near the climax, and then it just ends. For Christians, that yearning begins to focus in on what I'm going to call it as our story, John the Baptist, the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And then Jesus literally comes walking up to John at the Jordan and it's game on and we read this and you know, this is the climax this is God taking on flesh dwelling among us going to the cross to win this great victory over sin death and the devil raising to new you know bodily raising from the dead new life the gift of the Holy Spirit and the inbreaking of what we call the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and a whole new reality. And so that's the narrative arc of the Bible. So what I wanted to do was uh, start at the beginning. We're going to do one part a week. Uh, and when we get to part eight, because it's twice as long as every other part, we're going to do two weeks on part eight. Okay, so, um, and that will take us through Lent right up to the beginning of Holy Week. So the first chapter begins with Abraham. And if you're trying to go back and forth between your Bible and Wandgren's novel, we're in chapter 12 of Genesis. The first 11 chapters of Genesis are the collection of stories such as... Um, Noah and the Flood, the Tower of Babel, those are introductory stories that set the table in order to begin the real story, which is God saving humanity through the family of this one man and his wife. And so that's where the story begins in chapter 12. And I'm going to read just a little bit from the scripture so that you Kind of get the feel of it. Then I'm going to read a little bit from Wandgren so you can see how he's taking the biblical material and he's not trying to distort it. He's trying to add a little color commentary 
that is drawn from what we know from uh, social studies and historical studies and archaeology and so forth kind of add the little details in. So um, just read a little bit of chapter 12 here. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran, and Abram took Sari, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all of his possessions that they had gathered and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Cana. When they came to the land of Cana, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. So that's how the biblical story sounds as you're reading the material. And one of the issues that is true of the biblical material is at the time of their writing, literally thousands of years ago, we're, we're just looking at 4,000 year old material there. Um, you know, with the biblical story begins before the advent of writing. So these things are passed on as story by word of mouth within the family. Then eventually when writing becomes common, they start using it. Uh, think about things that we're used to, like writing, printing presses, computers, printers, cash, ATM machines, and so forth. None of that, okay? So when you were writing, when it was quill and ink on uh, calf skin, you had to kill the animal, prepare the skins, uh, very expensive process, very time consuming. And so ancient writers kept what they put down uh, to the essential uh, with a very minimalist view on it. We can print things like crazy in our society because paper's cheap, ink is cheap. Uh, I think 75 or 80% of the American households have computers with printers. So um, our handling of the printed word is very different. And you have the luxury of uh, more content. So here's how Wangren starts the story. An old man entered his tent, dropping the floor flap, the door flap behind him. In the darkness, he knelt slowly before a clay fire pot, very tired. He blew on a coal until it glowed. Then he bore the spark to the wick of a saucer lamp. It made a soft, nodding flame. The man's face was lean and wounded, and streaked with the dust of recent travel. He began to unroll a straw mat for sleeping, but paused halfway, lost in thought. Altogether, the tent was rectangular, sewn of goat skins, and everywhere patched with fresher skins of goats. Across the middle, a reed screen hung from three poles dividing the space into two compartments, one for the man, one for his wife. These two were all that dwelt in the tent. There were neither children nor grandchildren. There never had been. A vagrant wind slapped the side of the tent so that it billowed inward, but the man didn't move. He was gazing into the finger flame of the lamp. Old man, perhaps 80 years old, nevertheless, this present weariness did not come from age. In fact, the man had a small, wiry body as light and as tough as leather. 
nor was his eye diminished. It watched with a steady gray light awaiting interpretation. It was not an old eye, but a patient one. Not aged then, rather the man was made weary by this day's travel, and yesterday's war. So what you have here with Wandgren, just on this first page, is he has familiarized himself with the Abraham story as it's presented in Genesis, and he's beginning to pull things together. Uh, the great crisis of Abraham's life was that he had this sense of being called by an unseen God who spoke to him very occasionally, and he had this sense of being called to something. It was strong enough on him that he left his homeland in Mesopotamia, traveled up the Fertile Crescent, and then turned south and came through. It's a territory with so many names, they're all politically valued, the Levant, uh, Syria, Cana, Palestine, it's that land between Turkey in the north and Egypt in the south, and it's that eastern end of the Mediterranean, and he's called there, and he comes to the land and works his way south down to what's now Beersheba, and that sort of becomes his home base in the land. So he's following this call, it leads him to this place, and then the drama of his life works out as he's trying to figure out, God has called me here and he's made this promise to me, how is it going to work out? How do, how do we make this work? And so Wandgren is trying to pull that existential struggle together quickly and so he paints this picture and you uh, if you have a good storyteller they are working on your imagination I don't know about you but when I read that I can see this gray-haired skinny brown-skinned guy uh, kneeling his shoulders rounded his head down and these long wiry fingers holding on to a grass mat and I've seen, um, you know, these saucer-type lamps were very simple. They were like a coffee cup saucer, and when the clay was wet, they pinched one end of it, and you put a wick in it and fill up the bowl part with olive oil and light it, and that was your candle. That was how you lit the inside of your territory. So I can see those details in my mind's eye, and I can uh, picture a guy lost in thought like that in this tent with the wind flapping it and um, he, he's, he's pulled me into the scene and he's pulled me into the issue and then I'm struck by what do you mean yesterday's war? Uh, that That's a little bit of a shocker uh, when I think about war as an American I think of things like the Vietnam War or World War II, or the Iraq War, or Desert Storm, where you had these long political buildups and transporting armies halfway across the world with all their equipment and, and so forth. And um, yesterday's war, they don't start and end that quickly in my reality. So that kind of pulls me, makes my inquisitiveness factor jump up. So he backs off of that a little bit uh, in order to answer it. His only relative in the entire land of Cana, even from the Euphrates River in the east to the Nile in Egypt, was a nephew who had chosen the easier life. Okay, Though the old man himself lived in tents, Lot, his nephew, dwelt in the cities of the Jordan Valley, the watered places, fertile places, desirable, sweet, and green. But lately, four kings of the north, 
had attacked and defeated the five cities of the valley. One of them was Sodom, the city of Lot, the city that Lot had chosen. Among the prisoners whom the northern kings carried away then was Lot. As soon as the old man heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he armed 318 of his own men, mounted donkeys, and pursued the enemy with a light, secret speed. In the night, he divided his forces. He surprised the northern kings by striking from two sides at once. He routed them. He drove them home. And all of the plunder, all of their prisoners, he brought back to the cities that had been defeated. Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Sebulim, Zoar. Lot was free again, and again he chose Sodom for his dwelling place, though this man, the, though the men of this place had a reputation for extreme wickedness. That was yesterday. So he's pulling these things together, and he's giving you the story of Abraham. And this is part of Genesis. Every event is part of the biblical narrative. And so he has told this story about Lot. And this is what he does as a novelist in this first part that I think is really good. He brings Sari, later to be called Sarah, out from around behind that screen. And she gets into a conversation with her husband and starts out, you know, kind of a natural question. He's just come back. He's gone into his tent, and the wife says, is the young man safe? You know, did you accomplish what you went out to do? And he said, yes. And his children? And she's, she said, looking dead level at her husband, just the use of that word dead, well, this is you know, approaching an issue here. How are the children of the man who lives within the walls of houses? Safe, said the old man. They are home then, she asked. Lot sits contented among his children then. Lot looks upon the consolation of his old age. Then, because he has an uncle who saves him, when his own choices get him into trouble. And so now you're into this business about children and go, ooh. So if you're reading the biblical story, God's promise to Abraham and to Sarah is that he will make them the biological and spiritual progenitors of this great nation. And so they've moved there and they're going through all this drama there and the problem is they are very old and there are no kids. Okay, so here's the crisis. So um, I think that's a, a word about how Wandgren is going to tell the story. My contention is, and I, I hope you generally agree with me, is that he is not distorting the scriptures. Um, you know, things like that saucer lamp, archaeologically, for thousands of years, those things were easy to make. They were everywhere. Um, they were so common that people would use them, you know, like I need light in this place, and then they'd walk off and leave them for archaeologists to find now from when they left them three, 4,000 years ago. They were everywhere. And so for Wandgren to incorporate that into the story, it's the color commentary, it's the little detail that is tickling your imagination and getting you to think in these terms, and um, the reed mats and the description of the clothing and the food and all that sort of stuff is true, historically, archaeologically, and he incorporates it not to improve the scriptures or tear them down or whatever, but just he's working the story in a format that we're used to. So if you read part one, uh, you have um, 
the story of Abraham, and I, I want to skip down on page 15. A wind took hold of the tent flap and lifted it like a linen. Okay. Um, goat leather is heavy. Linen is like your bed sheet. A lamp flame guttered and went out. So that's kind of a blast of air there. And God said, come, Abram, come outside. Now, this is the entry of God into the story for the first time. On his hands and knees, the old man obeyed. God said, raise your eyes to heaven. Look to the stars, Abram. Count them. Can you count them? The old man said, no, I cannot count them. They are too many. Even so many, said the Lord God, shall be your descendants upon the earth. With the same gaze as he had earlier turned upon the lamp flame, Abram gazed toward the heaven. Now there was no wind at all. The air was absolutely still. Nothing moved in the land except that the man could hear the sighing of his old wife inside her compartment. He said, Is it required then that a slave born within my household must be my heir? And God said, Your own son shall be your heir. Abram says, How shall I know that? How can I know when you have given us no offspring? Then the word of the Lord came to the old man. Abram said, God, have you seen how a king will by a covenant establish his promise with his servant? Tomorrow, Abram, tomorrow prepare the feast. I am the Lord who brought you here to give you this land. Tomorrow I will make my covenant with you and thereby shall you surely know my promises to you. And so in this style, we are fully into Abram's existential crisis of being called into a sacred relationship with God. Genesis 15 is where this is in your Bible. And he enters into this sacred relationship, and then it has to work itself out in time. And so the story rolls on. In the second part of this, you have uh, Sarah introduced in kind of detail, and her dilemma is she's old, well past childbearing years, and she is trying to figure out a way, of how does this promise from God come into reality? And so she comes up with surrogate motherhood as her choice. And, you know, infertility, um, surely you have known couples that were not able to have children and how painful that is and the, the desperation, if you will, that, that goes with that. Uh, in our day and age, we have all kinds of ways of, uh, all kinds of medical procedures. And um, one of the things I've learned being married to a nurse is it usually the guy with a low sperm count rather than anything wrong with a woman. And so you go through all of this medical stuff painful, embarrassing, expensive, and nothing. And in our society, adoption's an option, but once again, very time consuming, extremely expensive, and um, certainly not problem free. And one of my cousins was uh, unable to conceive, and she and her husband finally turned to adoption and as sometimes happens, I, she talks about we kind of relaxed and had a set of twins. <laughs> so, um, but that infertility piece is, is a very human experience, and Sarah's full-blown into it. And in our society, there is surrogate 
parenting with invertro in I can't say it in vitro fertilization um, taking eggs sterilizing or yeah not sterile um, taking the eggs and then reintroducing them back into the womb and so forth and so on and sometimes that's a great solution sometimes it doesn't work either there are stories from time to time in our news where um, a woman will contract with a couple and become pregnant and deliver the child and then the child is turned over and essentially adopted by the, the couple I even remember one story a while back where uh, a mother who was still um, premenopausal carried the baby to term for her daughter, which you know, modern medicine is, makes it possible to do a lot of things. That's what we're talking about here with Sarah. Her choice was she took one of her female slaves that they had acquired in Egypt and uh, had her husband get the woman pregnant. And the ancient Semitics had a ritual where when it was time for the birth, the slave would sit in her mistress's lap and deliver the baby. And then the baby was legally, culturally, the mistress's child. And that's essentially what we're talking about dealing with here. One can brings in a bunch of stuff. Uh, like for example, uh, once Hagar is uh, pregnant, I remember a person saying, this story of, I want you to take my maid and have sex with her, said no woman ever. Um, Wangren kind of takes up on that and then uh, starts out, Hagar was not pretty. We don't know that. That's not in the scriptures. Uh, but what he does is he kind of creates a very believable Sarah getting annoyed and jealous as the pregnancy goes on. And this young girl, young woman who's pregnant, kind of cop an attitude toward her mistress. That's in the Bible. They get in, into it. And finally, after the child's born, goes on for years, Sarah finally kicks Hagar out into the desert. So that's part of it. So that's the beginning of it. And we will pick up next week. I am hoping that you will read part one where you get Abraham and Sarah, and then you get Rebecca, and then you get Jacob, and then you get Joseph. That's all in Genesis, okay? Uh, so that should have been the homework, if you will, for today. And next week, we'll then do the Exodus bit, uh, which is part two. The covenant starts on page 101 and goes through to 164. And it's the story of Moses, the people of Israel at Mount Sinai, and then the children of Israel uh, in the wilderness being formed into the faith community of Israel. So uh, thanks for joining us. And just on the COVID thing, parish council meeting last night, we talked a lot about um, what's going on. And basically, like everybody else, we're waiting for a combination of the vaccine and so forth to allow us to start to open up. And when we can, we will. But right now, January, um, we're just not having the congregation in the building, but we'll do classes and worship in the church on Sundays. And I'll do this from here. Uh, if you would, with this Facebook thing, I can see when people log on, and um, if you have any kind of questions or whatever, put that up, and we'll find a way to uh, make this more of a discussion. So, thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoy the book, uh, and we'll see you soon.